Good afternoon and welcome to our keynote presentation. My name is Jennifer Gately and I am a program manager at San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools. It is my pleasure to introduce our next esteemed speaker. Dr. Marlene Wong is Senior Vice Dean at the University of Southern California. She is a respected professor of mental health and former executive director of the USC Telehealth Clinic. For over 30 years, Dr. Wong has worked to develop a range of school-based policies and interventions. During this time, she has been engaged in a research partnership with Rand Health and the UCLA Partnered Health Research Center. She has also served as the principal investigator for the Trauma Treatment Adaptation Center for Resilience, Hope, and Wellness in Schools. Currently, Dr. Wong is focused on crisis intervention, including assisting schools in developing immediate and long-term COVID-19 recovery strategies. Dr. Wong, thank you for being here today. Welcome to the Wellness Conference. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Jennifer, so much for that introduction. And I just feel so honored to be here with you in this uh, virtual environment. Um, I know that there are many people out there just uh, really paying attention to what the news is as, as decisions are made and changed almost every day about how schools will open and whether they will open and under what conditions they will open and what that change might be should we see changes in the public health situation of our cities and communities. So let's start right out with the slides. And um, as you can see here, uh, I really want to talk about just some thoughts about opening schools in times of crises, because we are facing so many at this point in time. And uh, I believe that we, um, you know, we need to think about what our options might be and the context under which we are opening schools. So uh, as a uh, Jennifer mentioned I've been in a, a community-based research partnership since 1997, and all my partners are listed here. Although we started in LAUSD when I was the director of mental health uh, back in the 1990s. And since that time, we've done um, a lot of research on exposure to violence, especially in uh, children in middle school, and what the impact of that exposure has been, especially in relation to the rates of of PTSD and childhood depression. Um, when I, I think about uh, my career, although the last 12 years have been at a USC in a more academic environment, uh, I really think of my time in LA Unified School District as the mental health director and head of the crisis teams. We went through so many crises during the 1990s. Um, in 1984, the first one of the first school shootings in California at the 49th Street Elementary School, in which a mentally ill man who lived across the street from the 49th Street Elementary School had a cache of weapons. And as the children were coming out of school on a February afternoon, opened fire and held the school under sniper fire for over an hour and a half. And at that time, one child died immediately at the scene. One child died some days later and several of the administrators and staff were shot and wounded. It was when we first began to realize that dealing with trauma, with childhood trauma, is completely different from any other kind of counseling that we were doing up until that time. Um, because of the of the riots, um, because of the school shootings, because of the uh, crises that we had to face in Los Angeles, um, the Department of Education and the Departments of Justice uh, reached out to me and uh, I became one of their consultants to help schools, such as Columbine, Thurston High School, and others develop trauma recovery programs, and was then invited subsequently to Oklahoma City and to New York City after those terrorist attacks. So I've learned a great deal from the people who survived the uh, those, those horrific uh, mass violence events, they have been my teachers 
and the information I'm sharing with you today are the lessons that I learned from them as they recovered over a period of years. Also, um, my thoughts are, are very much shaped by the fact that I was a member of the teachers union for over 20 years. I was uh, a member of the administrators union in LA Unified School District for over 10 years, and that I've been a school board member at an Episcopal day school here in Los Angeles. Um, so having to make decisions based on those perspectives are very much integrated into what I'm going to share with you today. So let's start right out about what is a school crisis, because I don't think that we're just opening schools uh, because it's uh, necessarily to be on an online uh, environment, uh, working in a virtual world. That in itself is challenge enough. But I think that we're really uh, opening schools in a very volatile climate. And, you know, I welcome your thoughts about that because you may not agree. And, and this, this talk today is not to say uh, this, is, this is what it is. This, is. this discussion is really for you to think about your efforts and what your roles and responsibilities are and how does this, how does opening schools in a crisis, how is that different from opening schools? Uh, I, I, we, you know, we're in a number of high profile traumas in, in our society, which in themselves magnify existing uh, injustices and disparities. And in some ways we see events of the past in a clearer light. Uh, that we're not just confronting them today, but that we've actually experienced them uh, over time. So in this particular climate, it's especially volatile because we're really facing almost three crises, if not more. And you may be able to name more crises, but the ones that come to mind for me are that we're definitely in a healthcare crisis. COVID-19, a worldwide pandemic, the entire world is swept up in it, and we're having to change the way we live our lives every day. Um, the second is we're in an economic crisis. Because of COVID-19, everything has been shut down. The restaurants, all the things, sometimes dry cleaners, uh, businesses, certainly schools, and, uh, and that's what we're here about today, is opening schools and having to close schools. Uh, that has been a huge crisis in education, which is an anchor institution in our society. And the third is the whole series of racial crises and events, uh, which have opened up a question about whether or not we have a system of justice that is applied equally to all people, or whether in fact there are disparities, not just in the system of justice, but now what about the system of health care, or even the way we educate our children. These are things I think that we can't ignore when we think about opening school in a time of crisis. If we look at a definition of a school crisis, it's a sudden, unexpected, or unanticipated critical incident that poses a safety threat, maybe a health threat, it disrupts the school day, and it definitely interferes with teaching and learning it interferes with attendance and interferes with the behaviors that children, parents, and teachers engage in in order to make education a success. And common reactions to a school crisis could include shock, confusion, anxiety, fear, anger, resentment, and finally, trauma, child trauma and adult trauma. The um, objectives of a school crisis team, of which now we are almost everyone on this team as we begin to think about how to recover in this, is we have to act to establish a sense of emotional safety. That's one of the big objectives of a crisis team. We have to think about how are we going to bring students back to the classroom with a renewed sense of safety uh, and calm and a routine that they are familiar with, that they understand that in itself is a stabilizing factor. How do we assist with their reactions uh, to danger and traumatic stress? 
and how do we support their stabilization? The stabilization not only of our children, but of parents and teachers. This is a big job. Now, the disruption in K-12 education, if we look at some of the studies that have been done, is greater than anyone has imagined. Back in April, educators told Education Week researchers that 76% of students and 66% of teachers were in lower spirits than they were before the crisis. They were sort of experienced some mild depression. And this supports the whole idea that schools are much harder to access on the online environment. We were all in different places, depending upon whether one of the, we were one of 14,000 school districts around the country. And each school district was prepared to move toward a virtual uh, teaching and a platform, some better than others, some more effectively than others. Now, following that up, um, by the end of May, 33% of students in communities of poverty were not participating. Essentially, when it first started, 21% of students were truant. They just did not log in. They didn't make contact, even when teachers reached out. So we're looking at a pre-existing, as, as we move toward this reacting to and responding to this COVID-19 um, uh, world, we were already seeing that school children and teachers were being deeply affected. Then we look, if we fast forward to May 25th, we know that there were powerful emotions that were released. And the discussions and communications that were shared online in the media were very adversarial. Um, there were, if you look across the country, even politically among different representatives of our and different branches of our government, there were strikingly divergent points of view. And these divergent points of view heightened the issues. And the images also over and over again being shown on the television really bring those strong feelings to the forefront. And people, even if they were not in those communities, have strong reactions that almost reach the level of the people who were in those communities. Added to this is the idea of historical trauma. And there are some of you who are much, much more expert in this. But I know that historical trauma for groups, whether they're Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, et cetera, uh, LGBTQ uh, people, all of these issues of trauma and prejudice and discrimination are now out in the forefront and are part of what children across the country and their families are experiencing. If we add to that just personal histories of trauma and of injustice that people have been exper have experienced in their families or perhaps in their own lifetimes, as well as adverse childhood experiences, you can see that this is a time of crisis that is not like any other. It is complex, it is multi-layered, it has aspects of cumulative trauma, and possibly for some individuals, some aspect of a toxic level of trauma that we have not yet assessed as we begin to think about opening schools. So a school crisis team, who is on it? Well, it's usually an interdisciplinary team across the country, uh, whether we're in a school on the East Coast, in the Midwest, in a rural area, suburban area, uh, or urban area. And it is usually comprised of these individuals. But what I want to propose is, I think that as we open schools, every single person employed by a school district is now a member of a crisis team because we're confronting our children, we ourselves are confronting a crisis that we have to work through in order to reach a new normal. And that's a very, very daunting task. What are the qualities for crisis team members? They're not the same 
necessarily, they could be, as for those who are in other situations. Um, you know, maybe you're teaching, uh, maybe you're a custodian, you're a staff person. Um, but for crisis teams in particular, I developed this list uh, in a book that I helped to co-author and edit for Jane's um, information group. And for those of you who have military experience, uh, Jane's, Jane's is a organization, um, corporation in, in London uh, that is famous for Jane's Book of Ships. And it categorizes weapons and ships, etc., for wartime use. And after 9-11, uh, the Jane's uh, editors uh, contacted me and said that school safety is a matter of national um, safety. It's an integral part of the war against terrorism and that they wanted a little military handbook to be developed. So as part of that effort, I created this list of desirable qualities for crisis team members. And the first is a sense of responsibility beyond routine, but beyond your job description. Uh, the ability to establish rapport very rapidly. The ability to listen to difficult feelings and experiences of others. And in the thousands of people that I've spoken to across the country in different uh, periods of time after man-made or, or natural disasters, one of the things that is common and more frequent than I anticipated was that there were some educators, some staff members that said, I can't listen to this young person, this, this student, talk to me about their experience. Um, it's too painful. And I feel guilty because I wasn't able to stop that school shooting. I wasn't able to protect them in the way I really wanted to. And so the ability to listen to difficult feelings and experiences can be very, in fact, a factor that might prevent someone from being uh, a, per a person on the crisis teams. Uh, the ability to forge consensus. So when you're working in a team, and uh, usually the team is headed up by the principal, and you have all those other team members that I, I you know, listed previously on the slide, and they would come together and say, okay, where do we start? And the ability to work on that team, to come back together, to share your experiences, and then to say, let's, let's think about what next steps might be. That's what's important about being able to work on a crisis team. Uh, the ability to reduce conflict and fear, um, not to say, oh, yeah, you should be afraid, you know, or uh, that person is wrong and you, you, you have a right to be angry about that. Uh, but to be, to be able to work in a way where you acknowledge it, but yet to say what we need to do right now is to establish safety on the campus. Let's start with that. Let's start with how we can work together and feel safe with each other. And of course, the last is to reduce the stress and anxiety that really does act as a barrier to having students and teachers return to school and return to le learning. And as we saw in the previous slide, it's gonna be a bit more difficult because as we moved to that online platform, we already had kids who were not joining they were dropping out, they were truant. And it's going to take really active reaching out and thinking about ways and using every single staff uh, member and educators to support the effort to bring kids back to school. So in school crisis, um, we need to think about restoring the core policies and practices um, and, and the school culture. So when we, when we bring kids back together again, regardless of whether it's online or if it's in fact in person in the classroom or whether it's some hybrid approach, we want to be able to think about the culture that we created and to bring elements back in, in whatever platform, in whatever environment that we are working on. So for me, the first priority is supporting the teacher-student relationship. And every staff member, not just, uh, this is not just for the teachers, but every staff member who should be thinking about how do I support the teachers in this? The counselors, the secretaries, the um, educational aides, uh, the custodian, 
the people who worked in the cafeteria, if they're still on board, what, do, what can I do to support the teacher-student relationship? We also want to create positive school climates, and we want to look back, how did we do that? Uh, what were our policies and practices in order to make sure there was no bullying? Um, Anti-bullying interventions. Here's where we might need to use our school resource officers who look at social media. It can't be just the teachers doing everything. We need to use every person and their special talents and expertise to create this, to restore and renew the, the, the school culture and environment that we had before. Um, we want to look at in-seat attendance as, as the first sort of go around where suddenly we were thrown out of the classroom and into this online environment. There are some school districts that just didn't take attendance. But now I think there's going to be a renewed effort at the, on the part of each state to think about ADA, average daily attendance, who's attending and who's not. And when we find out who is not, it is just not the teacher's responsibility to bring those kids back to school. And it might be people that we never thought about to do that before working together in tandem. People from the attendance office who now need to work online as well. Um, our school psychologists and social workers, et cetera, our school nurses. How do we work together to get kids back into school? There is a rich culture that's been established over many, many years over each and every school district and within every school. Um, so those mundane daily routines that we took for granted are really important for calm routine and for people feeling like they've regained their school family. And we also, people have been very, very creative when they looked at ways in which to uh, celebrate uh, big events like the prom and graduation, whether they're drive-by graduations or proms out in, you know, in the open air with social distancing. But you might also think about new sort of customs and events that you might develop that can be uh, special to these times of, of hybrid or online education. So let's go back to psychological responses to trauma and key concepts that help us to understand what kids, students, teachers, and parents, as well as administrators, um, might be experiencing. And what we've learned over a mega analysis of many, many large scale uh, crises, et cetera, is that no one who sees a disaster is untouched by it. There's not one of us who hasn't been affected by either COVID-19 or the deaths that have occurred across the United States of African-American men, of people of color who have suffered injustices. And um, we all are living and trying to process and trying to think about new ways that we can address this to make sure that the social contract of equal justice is applied equally to all people. Um, now, immediately after most people pull together and do okay after a disaster, but their, man, their ways of coping have diminished. And that's, I'm not able to go into this today, but it's literally a different part of the brain that is operating when we are in survival mode. So it's not that part of the brain and the frontal lobes that take in new information and synthesize both, in, both emotion as well as, as thoughts and concepts and creates new coping ways. But it's the survival brain, which is, interested in either fight or flight. Um, in addition, there's a concern for basic survival. So education up there is a pretty high level um, anchor institution and the aims of and the mission of education is about educating young people for the future. But when we're talking about basic survival, that's at another level altogether. And layered on top of that, is that there may be grief and loss over loved ones. And personally, I experienced this when during February, my mother died, and two months later in April, my father died. 
and I could not see them because they were in hard quarantine. And when they died, I couldn't go to their funerals because funeral homes were not allowing people to hold ceremonies. But each one of us have even more, have serious and, and definitely I'm sure that there are those of you who are listening to this who have suffered greater losses um, and who have are struggling right now with family issues and and you know your children young children that you're very concerned about and loved ones across the board and colleagues as well so this fear and anxiety about personal safety and the physical safety of the people we love ranks very high, and it's right up there with basic survival. Um, let me just function on this particular slide, though. I want to emphasize that when people are in crisis, they have a need to talk about those events and feelings associated with those events, crises and disasters, and they have a need to talk about them repeatedly. Again, this is the survival part of the brain that is trying to make sense of these terrible times in which we are, you know, struggling to take the next step. And the reason I bring that up is because children who return to school, teachers who return to school, staff who return to school, administrators, each will have the need to talk about their story, maybe not to the same people, but those that's kind of the challenge that we're talking about now. How do we create those opportunities in situations in which each of those groups feel safe to talk about and share those difficult feelings? Now, I've developed a, a model of psychological first aid, again, uh, with colleagues, uh, Dr. Merritt Schreiber at UCLA, Dr. Robin Gerwitz, who's now at Duke. And we were asked to do this by um, Homeland Security after 9-11. Uh, and I'm not able to talk about that today, but you'll get information about uh, about that intervention. It's, a, it's not therapy. It's a guided discussion. And it helps individuals using the communication skills that they use every day to begin and to be able to safely end these discussions. So trauma is a public health issue along with COVID-19, along with the, the challenges that we're seeing in our society. It was widespread in some communities of color and poverty before these crises began, especially in urban areas, in zip codes with high levels of poverty and crime and gang activity and drug use. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, of, of violence exposure among children uh, who were in elementary school. And children in these neighborhoods are exposed to violence at an early age and f with a frequency and intensity that led directly to very high rates of PTSD and depression. And it also produces trauma, secondary trauma, like secondary smoke, very strong effects in the people who work with and care for these children. Um, I want to bring up ACEs because, again, there are pre existing uh, histories of trauma, and trauma histories play a huge role in the way that uh, children and adults respond to current crises. Uh, in some ways, the crises of the present have ripples to the past and open up and magnify those those crises, those traumas that were experienced earlier in life. Um, and like any disease, trauma starts with those who are most vulnerable, most vulnerable because they have other factors that operate in their life that are not protective factors, but are risk factors. So part of the early research I did with my colleagues at RAND uh, has to do with crisis intervention. And when we were going out in the 90s, it was a, a, during a time called that was called the decade of death. And it, and it was called that because there was so much gang violence in South LA and East LA uh, that the rates of gang-related uh, 
death were just off, they're off the charts. And when we would talk to kids who were caught up in the middle of this, especially schools where gunfire was, you know, bullets were flying across school campuses, uh, we would ask the children, has this ever happened to you before? And almost every child I spoke with said yes. So when I told my colleagues at RAND who are researchers, you know, I think we've got a real problem here in these communities because if you to have at a diagnosis of PTSD, the risk factor, the number one risk factor is that you have been exposed to, been a witness or a victim to an act of violence. And every single one of these kids said this had happened to them before. And uh, one of my colleagues said, that's just a story. You don't have any data. And people could tell a lot of stories. So I challenged them and said, then let's do the research because this is too serious for us to ignore. And when we did that research, we did you know, cohorts about 500 in different parts of the city, really focusing on those zip codes of high crime and poverty. What we found was that in South LA in particular and in East LA, the whole issue was that children as young as 11 had 88 to 92 percent of them had been hit, kicked, punched, or threatened with a gun or knife, and over 46 percent of them had been exposed to knife or gun violence as a victim or a witness. These are horrendously high rates of violence exposure. And of those kids, 27 percent of them had full-on PTSD. 27 percent. And they an additional 16% had childhood depression, had clinical levels of serious childhood depression. Prior, prior to that time, none of them had been identified or referred to either a school-based mental health professional, like a school psychologist, a social worker, a nurse, a counselor, and none of them had been referred to a community-based mental health provider. Um, and the reason for that was that PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder in children, and depression are often hidden in plain sight. We all see different aspects of it, but sometimes we come to our conclu a different conclusion. So for instance, when a father saw his son wake up in the middle of the night, find him watching TV, couldn't sleep, uh, didn't want to go to school, refused, got into fights at home with his brothers, he didn't ask, did something happen? He would ask, he would say, go to school. And if the kid wouldn't go to school or fought or continue to have these symptoms, he would punish him. He would impose discipline. And one of the fathers said to me, I was getting physical with my son. I didn't know that he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. What we also discovered is that 76% of the children excuse me, of the children, the 27% of those children who had PTSD, 76% of their parents identified other family members who also had PTSD. What they said was when we, when we did the educational piece of CBIS, Cognitive Behavioral Intervention for Trauma in Schools, there's a parent piece where we, we educate parents about what are the signs and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. 76% of the parents whose children t tested positive said, there's someone else who has this. And sometimes it was the parent himself or herself. So in 2003, we created one of our first um, evidence-based intervention called Cognitive Behavioral Intervention in, uh, for Trauma in Schools called CBITS. And it was published uh, as an effectiveness study in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was the considered an original contribution to medicine. And it on the very day that that was published, the lead LA Times editorial said that the, the rates of PTSD among 11-year-olds in LAUSD and those zip codes was higher than that the, the rates that were being published at that time by the Department of Defense. Here's just a brief picture. This is a, uh, I, those of you who have heard me talk before, I will always show, I will always show this map. 
um, because um, this map is an illustration of our research. This is a small portion of the West Valley in Los Angeles. Um, you can see it's a suburban area. You can see there's uh, sort of numbered monopoly houses, one, two, three, four, all the way up to nine. And uh, there are black dots. So what this represents is that children who are going to those elementary schools every day, over a period of about 10 years, the black dots represent unsolved homicides. So someone was killed at that location where the dot was, but the homicide was never solved. Doesn't represent all the homicides, just the unsolved homicides. And it points out that there are areas in our city where PTSD is not prevalent, not in the same way, and that the risk of PTSD is not as great as in some parts of the city. So these, these dots were a combination of LAPD um, information over 10 years and what we were saying in our research. So now are you ready for South LA in the zip codes of high crime, poverty, gang activity, and exposure to violence? Because the monopoly houses those little houses are schools, elementary schools, and the black dots are unsolved homicides. Here's South LA. These are not all the homicides, but over the same period of time, the unsolved homicides. And you could see here that you could barely find the schools. And in fact, on the day this was published in the LA Times, one of those schools had four incidents of gang activity where bullets were flying through, they had to go into lockdown and the children were sent to the floor to lie down flat so that they would not be hit by bullets. They were caught in the middle of gang warfare. And what we discovered also as we look backwards, remember this was back in um, 2003, uh, across 2008, uh, it culminated actually in a district-wide survey of prevalence of violence exposure. And it showed that it was mostly in those zip codes of high crime and poverty and gang activity. But as we look back on research, what are the effects of violence and trauma? Well, in 2003, there was a study that showed that children who live in those areas and are exposed to violence have decreased IQs and reading ability because their survival brains are always in play. The frontal part of their brains that takes in new information and is engaged in learning is rarely able to do so because they are living in environments of threat and danger. There are more suspensions and expulsions in our survey that African-American kids, especially African-American males that were exposed to violence before they were 11 years old, had rates of suspension to go off the charts that they had decreased rates of uh, high school graduation than other children, and also they had lower, significantly lower grade point averages. So the linkage between violence exposure, post-traumatic stress disorder, and depression have very strong connections with each other. And I guess my point is here, also more days absent from school, is that even though we're not dealing with violence per se, there's one aspect of the crises that are now moving across our country that we're all deeply entrenched in that does have to do with some violence, whether it's the violence of COVID and the rate at which people are getting ill and are dying, but also the violence that is being perpetrated in very various parts of our country. And it leads me to think about the achievement gap that all of us have been talking about in education for years, 30, 40, 50 years. And maybe it's really the cumulative effects of trauma that leave children behind. That it's not just about teachers. I really am very concerned about the level of teacher bashing that goes on when they look at uh, different areas of a city and say, well, why aren't those teachers doing as well as the teachers in suburban areas? And I want to say it's because there are different risk factors in families and communities, and there are different protective factors that are at play in different communities and in different families.
I can't go over this right now. I think we don't have time. But there, the brief history of PTSD is this. It, everything we know about PTSD comes from war. And it comes from historical, historical accounts of prehistoric accounts of the Peloponnesian Wars, uh, of the wars in across the Middle East and Europe for centuries, that they describe signs and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. But it wasn't until, if you look at this particular slide, it wasn't until the Vietnam War, fairly recently, that a full scope study was commissioned by the Veterans Administration to look into the symptoms, the risk factors, and the healing factors, um, prompting people to start thinking about ways in which we could develop effective uh, interventions to heal those individuals who had PTSD. And, you know, as we look at what's happened over time, that uh, rape clinics very rapidly rep uh, began to understand this is exactly what rape victims are experiencing. Uh, it wasn't until the 1980s that the scientific community accepted that children could be traumatized. And then we saw so many of the school shootings in which now it is known that it, it can't be disputed that, that children can be traumatized as witnesses and victims of violence. I just want to say too, I think we've reached another level in a societal understanding about PTSD. And uh, it happened just this, this week, and I wasn't, this, I turned in these slides, I guess a week and a half ago. But if you look at the paper a couple of days ago in your local paper, the Minneapolis police have said 150 of their officers have filed for disability because they have suffered post-traumatic stress disorder, both because of what was done by other officers in the death of George Floyd. And also they anticipate the possibility that up to 200 law enforcement officers will quit the Minneapolis police by the end of the year. Uh, I think the police that law enforcement was kind of the last bastion of saying, you know what, we just have to get over it. Um, PTSD may affect us, but uh, we're tough and we're just gonna ignore it. We're just, this, we're trained to deal with this. And I just don't think that they were giving themselves the credit for being human, just human beings. And that we all are vulnerable if we reach a certain level to the negative effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I'm going to move on here because if I if I end this talk at all uh, about what we're, what we're in for, and I and I don't want to give short shrift to this particular slide because I think that uh, it's very applicable to school openings, actually. Um, and I hope that it will help you think about what sort of phase that you might be in right now, what phases that you might anticipate over time as we think about the opening of schools in the context of the economic crises, the health crises, and the crises of racial injustice and disparities. So in every disaster and crisis, there is also, there is always a pre-disaster phase in which there are warnings. So if you wanna apply this to COVID or to 9-11 or to the murder of George Floyd and others, there were always warning signs. And we have people in our society who say, look at this has happened and we need to do something about it. But the majority of people may, might say, oh yeah, we're taking care of it, it'll be okay, you know, we're prepared. Um, and they're good people. I'm not saying that there aren't, that they're bad people, but maybe they reached a level of comfort, whereas we have what I call sort of the canaries in the mind saying danger, danger. And they're the ones who are warning us uh, that there's a threat in the, in the environment and we need to pay attention. 
So maybe the majority of us don't pay attention. And all of a sudden, the event occurs, the disaster, the crisis. And this, this actually, this diagram was created in the 1980s. I've used it ever since then. It's, it's a FEMA diagram, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, to describe the course of a crisis or disaster. And if I, if I could redo this, that event would plunge us all the way down to the bottom of that dark line at the bottom because it throws us literally, we just do not know what to do. Uh, we don't know how to cope with it. We don't know what to do next. And it's interesting because there's a concept called 108010. Now, it's based on research in another area. So I'm just using it loosely as a way to think about things. There's no research here that says, in fact, the research shows uh, different rates of trauma that people experience, depending upon if you're a child or if you're a, a regular civilian or whether you're a policeman or a person who's in the military. And they range from like 8% when a crisis does, uh, occurs all the way to 33%, which is at the far end for somebody, for instance, who's in Afghanistan and seeing daily, the possibility of daily, um, um, you know, warfare. But the 10-80-10 concept is a very general one that says, you know, 80% of us really don't know what to do when a crisis hits. So we're looking to the 10% of our leaders to say, hey, what are you thinking? What are we, what are, what are we supposed to do here? Um, and so in a crisis, some of you are natural leaders. You don't have to have a title. But some of you are natural leaders and say, you know what, I this is what we need to do. And that's why on a crisis team, it's a team. It's not just one person. It's so many brains coming together to say, let's talk about this. Let's figure this out. What are some of the best ways to begin? What are the first steps that we can take? Because in a crisis, we're plunged into this state of disorganization and chaos and many brains together especially with those 10% that are the leaders, can figure out a way to move forward. But in a crisis also, if we resume back, there is a heroic period, and it can last anywhere from three seconds to weeks. So the three-second mark was set by Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, because it wasn't three seconds after which uh, – they discovered that buses had been sent out to places, people who couldn't evacuate when they got to some places, the buses weren't there. The buses showed up at places where people didn't show up. Um, the evacuation was too late, etc. cetera. Um, in New York City, uh, the heroic period lasted for a number of weeks and it ended when people, especially the survivor families discovered that money that was being given to the Red Cross that a substantial portion of it, not all of it, was being set aside for future disasters. And the family said, this is for this disaster. Well, they didn't understand that this was sort of a way that the Red Cross had always operated, setting apart a certain amount. Um, and the, the period, and there was such an outcry and outrage that it began the period of what we call disillusionment. And all of a sudden, people began to think about, why didn't we do something in 9-11 when they bombed the, the towers? Like, what was it, 10 years before? They were actually successful. Wasn't anybody paying attention to that? Um, and they said, well, yeah, we were paying attention, but there was so much chatter, we didn't know. We knew they were planning something, we just didn't know when. But these discussions about disillusionment, why weren't we prepared for COVID? Why don't we pay attention to the fact? How did, how was it that so many African-American men were being killed across the country in different places? There was no, why didn't we step up and do something? Uh, so these discussions then become a part of this disillusionment and a, really a tearing down in order for us to rebuild. It is something that is our, the fabric of our society is li literally being torn asunder so that it can be rebuilt again.
And it is that period of working through the grief and the trauma and the anger and the rage, as you see here, coming to terms with our failings, with everybody's failings, individual failings, uh, community failings, national failings, and trying to rebuild in a stronger way uh, the institutions, our families, and ourselves in order to reach what we call reconstruction, a new beginning. It won't, it won't be anything like perhaps the normal that we experienced before, but that beginning. So here's where I think psychological first aid is certainly uh, can be helpful. And um, I, one of the things I think is going to happen is, is that I want to uh, fast forward, in fact, to the um, fact that uh, teachers also are subjected to a lot of stress and that we need to protect our teachers in every single way that we can. And they should be the first ones that we go to, to help and find out what kind of support can we, can we bring to them? Because it's like the, the adage about, you know, bring that when you're in the airplane, bring that oxygen mask to the adult so that the adult can take care of the child. And the same is true for teachers in the school. We've got to protect our teachers. I also want to say that um, we there, there's a saying, somebody attributed it to um, Darwin. But actually, it was said by Dr. Leon Meganson from Louisiana State University in 1963. And he said, it's not the most intellectual of the species that survives. It is not the strongest, but it's the species, it is the species that survives is the one that is best able to adapt to changing environments in which it finds itself. There is no environment right now in which we're going to have to make so many changes. But I really believe that the people that are on this webinar are people who are going to be the 10%, the leaders that are going to help us get to a new place. Because the risk factors that we are facing are not protective, are not predictive factors. It doesn't mean we're going to fail because we are all protective factors. Our thoughts We're the protective factors here. And um, I just want to bring up some resources. Some of these slides will be provided to you. I'm going to end here. Um, but uh, there are several that my colleagues and I have created over time. As I said, we've, we've probably published over 65 peer-reviewed uh, academic articles in, in some of the, the most prestigious uh, academic journals. A cognitive behavioral intervention for trauma in school, some of you may know of, especially those who are school psychologists and social workers and uh, counselors. CBITS, um, also for children the um, who are not, you, you, you suspect that their environments where, in fact, they're at high risk for trauma, but you may not be a, a clinician, and, but you're a teacher or a counselor or a graduate student. We developed and modified CBITS uh, for those individuals to use. It's called support for students uh, exposed to, to violence. And we just finished creating a um, new uh, intervention for bounce back, which is for elementary age students um, and that is being put online now the first two cycle the uh, cognitive behavioral intervention for schools support for students exposed to trauma which is called set you can get the manuals for free on ran.org we wanted to bring this to the public um, and and it's free we're not charging anything you just put in a bunch of paper um, cook your dinner you know after you hit print, and by the time you finish dinner and wash the dishes, you have the whole manual will be there. Um, and then lastly, psychological first aid, uh, listen, protect, connect, model, and teach. Uh, that is something that can be used by everyone, by everyone, by every person in the school community, especially during that period of disillusionment where people are coming back uh, with experiences of trauma, of fear, of worry, anxiety, and it helps to...
uh, calm them. It is based on cognitive behavioral theory and therapy, and it's also based on the latest brain research. So um, I thank you all for just uh, spending time uh, to with me. I wish I could see you all. Uh, if you have any questions, I think that uh, you can pose them online. But also, uh, I'll make a point of having these slides available to you through the wonderful people who brought this conference to you. So thank you very much, and have a wonderful afternoon and a, and a really blessed a year as you begin to start to start school anew. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our afternoon keynote session. We want to thank Dr. Wong for sharing her expertise and her insight on reopening schools in times of crisis. We hope that you all learned valuable strategies to support the students that are in your care as we all hope to return to school in the fall. As Dr. Wong said, you may access the materials by returning back to the launch page that you entered into this session and clicking on the briefcase icon that will allow you to download the presentation. And again, thank you, Dr. Wong, for making those resources available to our participants that attended today's session. So as you leave this keynote session, we invite you all to continue to enjoy the conference experience here with us at the Southern Region Wellness Conference. You have a 30 minute break time, so we encourage you to visit Visit our resource fair if you have not yet done so, engage in our student gallery, a walk through our learning lab, um, engage in professional conversation in our networking lounge, and of course, in the spirit of wellness, take a brain break. And then we will see you back for the afternoon breakout sessions that will begin promptly at 2.30. Thank you everyone for being here. Be well, be safe, and take care.